Father, we do thank you that Jesus came to be human like us. Father, we are reminded of all the human beings that are riding this planet with us. So many that don't know you, don't have the opportunity to know you unless somebody goes. And so as we've been reminded this morning, Father, we are praying to you, the Lord of the harvest, that you would send forth workers into the harvest field as you did once long ago and continue to do through our days. We pray, Father, even from our midst, that you might raise up those who will go, those who will help, those who will fund. Lord, we know there are new and different ways of reaching out to, with the gospel to others. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to take advantage of those things, to reach into countries that hitherto were closed and are closed. But Lord, they're not closed to the internet. They're not closed to the airways. And Lord, we pray that you will teach us how to reach out to people. Lord, even in our own community, there are people who do not hear the gospel and have no opportunity to accept it or to reject it because they have not heard. So, Father, we pray that you will send forth laborers from us into this harvest field as well. We ask, Father, as we study your word today, that you will direct us in our responsibilities and what you would do yet through us. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Return to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, we're coming to the end of Jesus' life on this earth. And in verse 28, it says, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. We are now at the fifth message of Jesus Christ from the cross. We're calling these the thorn-crowned messages. I don't believe Jesus was complaining. I believe Jesus was communicating a message to the people around him, a message that we can learn from even today. And as we are meditating upon these things, and hopefully uh, if you're on Facebook uh, or if you're on, I think they're going on out on Instagram and other uh, media, you can get the daily readings and the opportunity to meditate and think upon these things. But he knew his mission was finished, and he said, I am thirsty. Now, I want us to study one word. We don't normally study grammar, but I, let me teach you a little grammar. Let me show you why grammar is extremely important. You say, well, pastor, you got one word, dipso, one word. I want to show you there's a lot in that one word. I'm going to attempt to do that anyway. Jesus makes a one-word statement. In Greek, it's the word dipso. And everything that we have to translate about this and everything that it teaches us comes from this one word. Remember, Jesus is hanging on the cross. He's in great pain. He's nearly exhausted. One of the things you have to do on the cross is in order to get breath, you have to push yourself up. Take a breath. And then so you're not going to be doing long discourses. That's why Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. That's a long statement. That kind of takes it out of you. Dipso. Well, that's one word. Uh, I remember uh, uh, visiting a brother in the hospital, and he was say, bebe, 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 bebe. Anybody know what bebe means? Come on, some of you are picking up. Drink. Not a Cajun in the group. <laughs> bebe means I'm thirsty. It's, it's very similar in Spanish. It's, it's a, if you say it just right, it's a, I'm thirsty. Jesus said, Dipso. Well, they knew, he's saying, and let me, let me analyze this for you. The, the, the W there, do you see the W in that word on the very end of that? That is the first person singular. That one letter tells you who's talking, whether it's a group of us, whether it's you talking, whether it's, it's the, in, in a, a language like Greek, and there are a lot of languages like this in the world, the way you uh, do the endings tells you who's speaking. And how it's arranged that way. So that one word is telling you, I, it's singular. So it's telling you that I'm doing it. Not we're thirsty, but I'm thirsty. He goes on then, uh, the next form that's there, the rest of that form, you take that W off, which is an omega, by the way. Take the rest of that off. It's, it forms the word to thirst, and it is the present active indicative mood. Isn't that great? Hang on. We'll try to get there. 
Present tense means it's an ongoing situation. That's what present. When you have something that's in the present tense, it means it's an ongoing situation. Not I was thirsty. I will be thirsty. That would be future tense. You've got past tense. You've got future tense. You've got present tense. I am thirsty, and it's an ongoing situation. I'm going to be thirsty. Now, Jesus is only going to be thirsty about five or ten more minutes. We're that close to the end of his life. And what are you saying here? I am thirsty. It's active. It means I'm the one doing the action. I'm the one experiencing thirst. And it's indicative. It's stating this is a real fact. It's not a hypothetical situation. I am really thirsty at this point. And then, of course, the word thirst. He is thirsty. He is right now thirsty. Now, there are six pieces of information. You've been jotting it down in your bulletin. There are six pieces of information in five letters or four letters. That's a lot of information. Whew, glad I didn't say any more. You know, when you study the scriptures, you've got to pay attention to the grammar. That's important. You've got to study that. And there are a lot of tools nowadays that will allow a person who doesn't know Greek to be able to put your, your mouse or your little cursor on the thing, and up will pop all this information. If you do that, you can pop up and it'll say present, active, indicative, first person, singular, of dipso, dipso, uh, dipo, dipto, which means to thirst. It'll tell you all that information. Now, why is that important? Why is all that, all that information there? Well, the, the second thing, not only is grammar important in getting us information, but it's also vital to us to study the context. There is no such thing as a word defined out of context. You can't define a word out of context. You've got to know the context. I want to show you something in the context that you and I need to understand. Just before he says this, John says, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. That's the first thing. Jesus knows that what he came here to do, I have done. He prayed earlier in the garden. He said, now my soul is deeply troubled. Should I pray, Father, save me from this hour? There in the upper room. Should I say, God, save me from this hour? He says, but this is the very reason I came. Less than 24 hours before this, Jesus is praying. Jesus is thinking about my mission is almost at its end. In less than 24 hours, Jesus will have completed his mission. He is hanging there on the cross and he knows his mission is done, but he knows there's one more thing that's still got to be done. He goes on to say in verse 28, he knew his mission was now finished and to fulfill scripture. He said, I am thirsty. Now, by the way, while we're still in John, before we go back to see where this is in scripture, notice what they did in response to what he says. Verse 29 says, a jar of sour wine was sitting there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. In other, in other words, in order for him to drink. Now, I want to suggest to you that Jesus did this deliberately. I'm not saying he wasn't thirsty, but I realize Jesus wanted to get across to those people that I am thirsty, you need to do something about it. And he wanted us to observe what they did about it and learn. Jesus is communicating to us here something very important about himself, about the mission, and about what we ought to do about that. Let's look at that. It says he did it in order to fulfill the scripture. Well, the question naturally arises, well, what scripture was he fulfilling? What was he doing? Turn back with me to the Psalms. Chapter 69, I hope you have gathered from last week. Psalms are really important. These are not just in there just so they'd have something to sing when they went to the tabernacle. Uh, these were really important. They're communicating the message. Psalms chapter 69, verses 20. It's on page 484 in the Pew Bible. We find this described. I'm going to start reading verse 19 just because it's sort of in the frame there. The psalmist says, you know of my shame, scorn, and disgrace. You see all that my enemies are doing. Their insults have broken my heart, and I am in despair. If only one person would show some pity, if only one would turn and comfort me, but instead they give me poison for food. Now notice the next phrase. They offer me sour wine for my thirst. Have you heard that before? 
I believe Jesus said, I'm thirsty in order to demonstrate the word of God and the response of people to the word of God. It was a very deliberate act. I don't think Jesus spoke anything from the cross that wasn't vital, wasn't an important message. These are not, sometimes we've called these the seven sayings from the cross. They're not sayings, they're messages. Sometimes we say the word from the cross. Well, a word means a message. Jesus is communicating a message, a message that the world needs compassion, pity. There is a lack of compassion around the cross. Remember, people are mocking. Even people passing by, people just on the way somewhere, they take a minute and holler over their shoulder and mock at him and move on. They don't even stop to mock. They're just moving by, passing by. I got somewhere to go. Let me mock what's happening with you. Let me mock what is going on here. Let me holler out and call out in derision. Of course, there were some people who very deliberately gathered around to mock Jesus on the cross. Lack of compassion. Lack of compassion. Well, they offered him sour wine. I would suggest that's not necessarily a mark of compassion. When Jesus hung on the cross the first time, they offered him wine, and then they offered him sour wine. I want you to consider that just for a moment. When Jesus was first being nailed to the cross, lifted up and then his feet nailed, they offered him a wine that was mixed with myrrh. Wine and myrrh. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. They offered him a drink that would have helped ease the pain, at least initially. You can drink this uh, wine in those days. The most you could do with wine was 14 to 16 percent alcohol content. That's just naturally as much as, al- as wine is going to get. It wasn't until later, till distillation came in, that you were able to fortify wines and make wines much stronger. That's why you have to be real careful when you say Jesus drank wine. Well, it doesn't mean he drank the wine we drank. You know, words mean what they meant then, not necessarily what they mean now. You can go to the store today, and uh, you can go down, and you can see a lot of things that uh, the Bible has no word for them because there wasn't anything that strong in Bible time. Even the wine they had was often watered down to where it was much less. <clears throat> Almost anybody in those days, watered it down uh, one part wine to three parts water, sometimes four part water. Some people even watered it down one part wine to 11 parts water. Well, that's really going to cut the alcohol content down quite a bit. So you have to be real careful with that. Uh, what they were offering Jesus was not wine. And by the way, they would put the myrrh in. It had sort of bitter taste. It was also believed that myrrh had some sort of medicinal property. Uh, they didn't know about essential oils. They couldn't drip it in one of those things and scatter it through the house. So they put it in the wine and said, well, you drink that. And if you drink enough of that, the nails won't hurt as bad. And, uh, but it would have fogged Jesus' mind on the cross. So he refused. He refused the wine and the myrrh. He said, I'm just not going to drink that. What they did offer him was what you could go to the store today and buy is wine vinegar. And uh, what happens is there's a naturally occurring bacterium that's associated with the grapes. It's on the grapes. And it produces uh, acetic acid. So what it does, it takes the alcohol content of that and transforms the alcohol into acetic acid. Now, it doesn't do all of it, but does the vast majority of it. This was the drink of the common person. If you you were out and uh, you didn't want to drink the water someplace because the water was possibly contaminated, Uh, if you saw the sheep standing in the pool you wanted to drink out of, you say, I think I'll have a little wine vinegar. And you could take a little bit of wine vinegar and uh, it would sort of satisfy your thirst. It would quench that thirst. It would kind of take care of that and deal with that. Kind of like drinking pickle juice. I see some common people here. You drunk pickle juice. You know, it's, it's like, well, that kind of does it. And so what they had offered him was this wine vinegar. This, it's called sour wine. It's wine vinegar is what's happening. And they've offered it up to him. Now, is that an act of compassion? Maybe, maybe not. Remember, they offered it up to him before. When the priests were mocking him and the sign was over him, this is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. And so they're offering him up that wine vinegar. They would never have offered Pilate wine vinegar. They would never have offered Herod Antipas wine vinegar. When the king called for wine, he got the best wine we had. What they were doing, they were offering sour wine to mock Jesus. You're the king of the Jews. Here, have some wine vinegar. 
have some wine vinegar. I don't know if this was compassion. It might have been. But we saw last time that when Jesus cried out and they thought he was calling for Elijah, somebody offered him some wine vinegar and said, hey, let's, leave. let's see if Elijah's going to come. Let's hear what else this fool's got to say. Basically what he's saying there on the cross. I would suggest to you that when Jesus cried out, they had never offered him the other wine, the wine that could have eased his pain in his dying moments. They offered him this wine vinegar to kind of wet his lips and let's see what else he will say. Do you realize that God never gets thirsty? God never thirsts. God never has a need that you and I can meet. But Jesus said, what do you say? I am thirsty. You know why Jesus got thirsty? Because before the world began, the plan was in order to rescue you and me, Jesus would become a man just like us. Long before the first molecule was created, before everything was put together, in what we call eternity past, which is, by the way, a misnomer. There's no such thing as past or future in eternity. There's just eternity. But long before creation began, the scriptures tell us that there was a plan that Jesus would become human, would take upon himself all of humanity, not just a human body, but a human soul and spirit. He would become fully human. Why? Well, some would say, well, he had to be fully human because the only way we could understand God was to have somebody with flesh on, somebody in flesh and blood that could explain God to us. And that's not untrue, but I don't really think that's the issue. Jesus was fulfilling a mission, and that mission involved him taking upon himself humanity because the only thing a human can do that God can't do is suffer and die like a human being. Of all the statements that Jesus made on the cross, this is the one that lets us know I became a human so I could share your sorrow, so I could die in your place. That's the mission he came to accomplish. Jesus knows five minutes, ten minutes tops, I'll be dead. But there's one thing I need to communicate to you. I need to say this so that people will understand I had compassion on you. I took pity upon you, and I became a human being to express that compassion. The humanity of Jesus Christ tells us that he came on our behalf. Let me tell you a little story. I think this is where that goes. There is a story the Chinese teachers tell. I'm going to refer to my notes here to just so I can get the story. It tells of a woman who lost her son. He died. Only son. And she was grief-stricken all out of reason. Nothing could overcome that. She made her sorrow a wailing wall. Finally, one day, she went to an old wise philosopher, and he said to her, I will give you back your son if you will bring me some mustard seed. However, the seed must come from a home where there has never been any sorrow. Well, of course, she grabbed at the chance. She began searching diligently, going from house to house, asking in every case, she learned of a loved one who had been lost. Finally, she said, how selfish I had been in my grief. She said, sorrow is common to all. Why did Jesus become human? Because sorrow is common to the human experience. When man sinned in the garden, death passed upon all men. How do we know that that's come? Because the wages of sin is death. All die. Everyone is going to experience sorrow. Somebody you love is going to die. One of these days, somebody that loves you is going to experience sorrow because you are going to die. And God, in his great plan, and because he so loved the world, said, I can't let that go on and on and on and on for eternity. I'm going to put a stop to it. I'm going to turn death into sleep, and I'll do it by becoming human, and I will die in your place so that one day I can wake all of you up and you can experience eternity with me. Jesus Christ became a man in order to accomplish that for you and for me. And there on the cross, he was doing that. He also was highlighting for us, you need compassion. What did the psalm say? The psalmist said, let me, let me go back to that, uh, that verse and read it for us. If only... One person would show some pity. 
If only one would turn and comfort me. When Jesus was saying, I am thirsty, he's also communicating that. One of the problems around the cross was lack of compassion. Would it be too much to say that's still the problem today? Lack of compassion for other people. 30 million a year dying without Christ. As the song says, no man cares for my soul. If we had compassion, we recognize that God is a God of compassion. And if I'm going to be like God, I've got to have compassion on other people. We wouldn't let that stand. We'd at least give them an opportunity to hear the gospel. Compassion. You and I are going to meet people this week who are carrying heartache and sorrow. We're going to meet people like the song, the signs were saying, you know, I messed up again. It's bad to mess up once. It's terrible to mess up again and again and again. We're meeting people like that all the time. On they go, the song says, through private pain. I know they're just carrying inside, and sometimes you don't know how sorrowful they are inside. What do they need? Pity, compassion, and to know the one who is all compassionate. They need to know about Jesus. When we look around, when we lift our heart from our sorrow and look around, we see people who are in need of compassion in need of the great compassion of God, they need to know Jesus. How do you reach them? Well, first you show them some compassion. Sometimes it's as simple as listening. Well, that's painful, isn't it? I gotta listen. Oh man, I have stuff to do. You know, sometimes people just need somebody to listen intently while they talk and share what's going on in their life. They just need somebody to sit down with them and say, well, let's talk. What's happening? Sometimes it may take a more active form. We may actually meet some need they have. It can be as simple as helping somebody with groceries or opening the door or maybe a more intense need. You may take food to somebody. Sometimes that's very important. Uh, Food is love. We are love people. Uh, That food is love. You know, when you take things to people, when you try to meet needs, when you say, hey, there's a need for this, let me see if I can help out here. We are communicating, I have compassion upon you. We're being godly when we are compassionate to other people. It's more than sympathy. It's real help when needed. Hebrews 2.18 says, since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. It is the humanity of Christ. It is his high priestly role. Jesus Christ lives to intercede on our behalf. Hebrews 7.25 said, Therefore he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. How many of your sins were yet to be committed when Christ died for them on the cross? All of them. How many of your sins have you committed in your lifetime? Now think about that. All of them, moment by moment. And you have a high priest who understands the temptation, who has paid for that sin, and who is at the right hand of God the Father, constantly interceding for you and for me. You will be saved to the uttermost because of your faith in him. When you trust him, you can say, man, I've got a high priest. It's always at the right hand of God, praying for me, interceding with God for me. And just as he prayed for Peter, that his faith not fail. And Peter then went out and denied him three times, but then God restored him. Jesus Christ had him stand up on the day of Pentecost and led 3,000 to the Lord in one day. Why? Because it was God doing it, not Peter. Because God showed him compassion. And because Jesus said, I have prayed for you. When you are restored, when you are restored, I have prayed for you, it's going to happen. Why? Because Jesus asked for it. Jesus asked for you. That's why you're here. He asked for you. So I want you. Father, give me that one. Give me that one. Give me that one. He is able to intercede. We have such a high priest. He could say, thirsty, I'm thirsty, But there was no guarantee they would give him sour wine, particularly when they had wine with myrrh available. 
That reminds me of this lesson as we close. Every word of God proves true, Proverbs 30, verse 5 says. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. Why did Jesus say, I am thirsty? Because the scripture said you're going to need to do that because you need to point out the problem. Nobody's showing pity. You need to fulfill the scripture. Well, how is he going to fulfill the scripture? They're going to give him sour wine. They could have given him the other. The reason why it happened, because Jesus said it, and the word of God says it's going to come about this way. You and I need to understand that what God has said will come to pass. It's going to come to pass for us because we have come to him for protection. Let's bow together in prayer. Lord, your word will be fulfilled. Everything you have spoken is going to come to pass. Lord, there's a lot of things in this world that are out of our control. Nothing we can do about them. Sometimes we can show compassion to people. We can help. But Lord, we're not going to be able to change the situation as it is. But that's okay. We can do what we can do, what you've given us to do. Father, we can do it in faith, knowing that every word of yours is going to be fulfilled. What you have declared about us will be true. We one day are going to be just like your son, Jesus Christ. We're going to reflect your character. Lord, you're already working in our hearts and lives to accomplish that. Sometimes we see it. Sometimes we mess up again. But Jesus has prayed for us, and it's going to come about. I pray, Father, that you will send us forth from this place with your compassion, with your message, that Jesus Christ loved us and died for us on the cross. That you raised him from the dead three days later to testify to the world that you have accepted his sacrifice, and you have appointed him high priest. Lord, you've appointed him as judge. Father, I pray for the people in this world, billions of them, to have no gospel witness whatsoever. Lord, I pray for the people around us who have a gospel witness but aren't hearing it. Lord, perhaps through being compassionate to them, you will open the door for us to share the good news of Christ and change their eternal destiny once and for all. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.